Hello? Hello? Are you already doing your shit? Yeah, you are. Hello? How are you? Missed you. Kisses. Uh, phone missed you as well. Anyway, so today we are going to look at... Where is it? Atomic Clocks. I'm going to start with this one and go. Supported in part by the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation, Inc. Also, this is by Engineer Guy. Sub to him. He's cool. I want to show you the most amazing thing. The world's first commercially available chip scale atomic clock, Symmetricon CSAC. That's right, this tiny device, about the size of a quarter, is an atomic clock. The most accurate atomic clocks lose about a second over 138 million years. The way that atomic clocks work amazes me. Let me explain how the very first one worked. Wait. I'll start with jello. Tap a block of jello and it wiggles back and forth. Just like the swings of a pendulum in a grandfather clock, the oscillations of this jello keep time. Now, jello isn't very good for this, but inside an atomic clock, there's a chunk of quartz of a similar shape that if we tap it, which we do with a jolt of electricity, it will oscillate some five million times per second. It keeps time to about one second in 90,000 years, a well, fraction of the accuracy needed for an atomic clock. Quartz loses time because it slows down and needs to be nudged to restore its oscillation. That's where the atomic part of an atomic clock comes into play. We use cesium atoms to control these nudges very accurately. Every time the quartz's oscillations slow down, just the tiniest bit, we give it a tap and electric jolt at just the right time. So essentially, its oscillations never decay. Let me show you how we use cesium to do this. The atoms in pure cesium exist mostly in two slightly different forms. A low energy form and one with just a bit more energy. For an atomic clock, these two states have two properties critical to making a clock. One, they can be separated by a magnet, and two, the lower energy atoms can be converted to the higher energy ones if we bombard cesium with the right radiation. Inge Isn't this a lot of science? It's just like, wait, so the, what is this clock for? Give it a second. It's only four minutes. It's only four minutes. tie the slowing down of the quartz vibrations to the precise wavelength of the bombarding radiation to create a feedback loop. Let me show you how. In an oven, we heat cesium chloride to create a gaseous stream of cesium ions. The stream contains both the low and high energy ions. We first flow it through a magnet, separating the two types, discarding the high energy ones, allowing the lower energy ions to pass into a chamber. Inside the chamber, we bombard the ions with just the right wavelength radiation to make them jump to higher energy. As these gaseous ions leave the chamber, they pass through another magnet that directs high energy ions toward a detector, this time discarding any lower energy ones. So it's almost like these come in in intervals, right? Now, the hot, hot ones, they're already going to go down, but these ones are going to need to be warmed up. So how do we do that? With a nuclear power plant, because apparently it's a lot more effective and safer for the environment than burning wood that has chemical thing you know like all that jazz right but it gets warmed up through the radiation goes through another magnet so that way it can collect those hot ones because apparently the first hot ones are hot cross buns and they're not actually what you want no you want to bake your buns those buns you don't know if they're good you know they might use quail eggs instead of actual chicken eggs Peasant. and we don't do that we don't eat like the hell The fact that they went into woods and put mud all over their shoes. Huh. I'm, just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But yeah, that's basically it. It's like, yeah, it's like, it, like we can take these buns, I guess, from the store. But we want to also warm up. Ah, where did you go? Ah, okay. But we want to take these yellow ones and warm them up. So they are also hot cross buns. And we will also put them through a thing. But they come with a detector to let us know. Uh, how many buns we warmed up in comparison to how many were already hot when we got them to the house. The detector converts the arriving ions to a current. The trick here is to tie that current from the detector to the quartz oscillator. 
when the quartz's oscillations decay, that is, it slows down a little, then the energy bombarding the cesium ions in the chamber changes and fewer high energy ions exit the chamber, so current decreases or stops. This tells the electronics to zap the quartz oscillator and correct the period of oscillation. It does this by applying the proper voltage that, via the piezoelectric effect, taps the quartz and restores its oscillations, thus creating a clock that loses less than a second over many million years. So at some point, shit. Yeah, there we go, there's a clock. So at some point, this starts wearing down once it fills, almost like it, it, it hits a uh, quota. And then, like, once the quota fills where it's discarded, it starts over again to fill. Oh, that, no, that's too cold. Uh, warm the buttons. My next shave is all the boys to the yard. And they're like, it's better than yours. Damn right. It's better than yours. I could teach you, but I'd have to charge. My milkshake brains all the boys to the yard. And they're like, ah, 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 ah. damn right. Ah, 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 ah. Like, okay, I'm done being a dumbass. Okay. Our world runs off such accuracy. For example, the Global Positioning System, GPS, requires it. The Global Positioning System consists of 24 satellites orbiting the Earth. A GPS receiver uses the position of four of these satellites to locate itself. Okay. One to correct the time on the receiver, and three to locate its position. Here's how it works. A signal is sent to the receiver from the first satellite There's the first that satellite's catcher. location and the signal's time of departure. The receiver then multiplies the signal's travel time by the speed of light to calculate its distance from the satellite. With one satellite, the receiver knows that it's located on a sphere around that satellite with a radius equal to the calculated distance. So it has the same calculation with a second satellite. The intersection of these two spheres narrows the location to the circumference of a circle. Then with a third satellite, the, the receiver can reduce the location to a single point. Oh, we have a Since signals are traveling at the speed of light, being off by even a millisecond means an error of about a million feet or 300 kilometers. But with atomic clock accuracy, the receiver can locate itself to about three feet. I'm Bill Havoc, the engineer guy. This nice. video is based on a chapter in the book, Eight Amazing Engineering Stories. The chapter features more information about this subject. Learn more about the book at the address below. Very interesting, right? Let's get on to the next subject. How atomic clocks are reinventing time. Then why would that be important? Well, you're about to find out. Shut up. Just shush. In Wait. the movie Interstellar, a landing craft explores a planet near a black hole that has a mass 100 million times that of the sun. Like they're just chilling. The crew spent just a few minutes on the planet, but when they return to the main ship, 23 years have elapsed. I've waited years. It's 23 years, four months, eight days. The idea of time dilation by going into deeper gravitational fields is actually pretty accurate. First theorized by Einstein in his theory of relativity, it's known as time dilation. The very bizarre thing is that when you're in a place where gravity is stronger, time moves more slowly. But that's not all. Huh. Another way time dilation occurs is through your relative movement through space. If you have two observers that have clocks that tick at exactly the same rate, and then one of those observers moves away at very high speed, the moving observer's clock will tick more slowly. Their time will literally pass slower. And a lot of people are confused by this because they think it might be a mechanical thing, it's the clock. But no, it is in fact literally time. It doesn't matter what the clock is. It could be a clock, it could be your heartbeat. It's time. It's almost as if wherever you go, that's where you are. But the timing is weird, you know? It's almost like, oh, it's only been five minutes since we've been in here, but 50 years and a half on the planet. How is that? How is that? Probably because this time here is different than the time right here. This is its own time. At this point, after it's left the planet and it's all doing whatever fuck it wants to in space, this has its own reference of time outside of this. So whatever it's doing... It's on its time. It's not on the planet's time once it leaves the planet. It has its own time. It is being a time traveler right now without really being a time traveler. It's just left the time frame of this thing and had its own time going. 
That's it. It had it, it was in its own little vacuum, its own little world, while the actual world was moving without it. The world passed them by. This is even true for someone who is walking, compared with someone sitting at a table. Time moves slower for the person who is walking. Similarly, for gravitational time dilation, someone who is at sea level, compared with someone on a mountain, will also experience time at a slower rate. That's because gravity is stronger when you're closer to the Earth's center of mass. But in these examples, the amount of time dilation is so minuscule that it's totally unnoticeable. Apart from a few examples, humans don't deal with fast enough speeds or enough gravity to experience a significant amount of time dilation. Okay, I just want to bring this up because I just suddenly remembered this from Bill Nye the Science Guy. But apparently there were these two Greek dudes, and I don't remember much of it, so I'm just paraphrasing and going off of memory. But apparently there were these two Greek dudes, and I guess they wanted to check what the time was here compared to over there. I don't know how they come up with these fucking questions back then, but they were very smart people to at least ask questions. And then eventually they found out questions will make them be put on the stake by the state. And that sucks. It sucks. When the state decides you're asking too many questions. But before that, there were plenty of questions. Well, I don't know. Because I think someone got ran out of town and was called a bastard philosopher. But I can't remember who that is. Anyway, uh, apparently these two dudes decided they were going to use a sundial to check the time. And I don't know how they talked to each other. Without a phone at such distances? I don't know. But, um... What they eventually found out was one was significantly at a different time than this one. Like, depending on how far apart they were, because I don't remember. Um, the time change was almost like a time zone change, where it was like an hour behind or ahead. They, it was that much of a difference, and they realized, oh, different areas mean different time. And I just now remember that. It's just like, so yeah, wherever you are, it is what it is. So you are on your time... In your time alone. So if your friends decide that you're just gonna like you're not cool because you keep ending up being late, bring it up to them. Why don't you guys do me a solid and just tell me the time like an hour earlier, knowing that I'm gonna be an hour late? Like you should be smart enough to figure me out. But we shouldn't have to. You should respect our time. You should respect me to know that I value my time. And you should know my schedule. I don't know, like. I I mean, I, I guess it all depends. Like, if you're dealing with a Gemini, that's a whole different story. I, like, you might as well give them an earlier time. And then they'll show up on time, and you, they don't have a reason to be fucking mad at that point. Because the Gemini's gonna be late for everything. Like, it, like, oh my god, don't give a Gemini a deadline. They'll probably ghost you for life for that shit, just so they don't feel embarrassed about not getting it done on time. But that may not matter. Because atomic clocks are reaching a sensitivity that can measure even the tiniest amount of time dilation. I think that's the place where relativity will start to become far more important. It's because, not because we can go so fast, I mean I wish we could go fast, but I think the real place will be because we can measure things with an incredible precision. That's amazing. That level of precision will enable us to use time in ways we never thought possible, like monitoring tectonic plates, large movements deep below Earth's surface, Where'd and water climate go? change. Atomic clocks could even lead to new discoveries regarding the nature of time itself. Oh, okay. I think that's one of the really exciting things about this is that we're really, you know, exploring the unknown. Um, we're able to sense effects that no one has been able to see before using the precision of the clocks. Moonshot conversations. In 2010, two ultra-precise, synchronized atomic clocks were put next to each other. Okay. Now these clocks were so precise that they would lose about one second over the history of the entire Earth. Okay. Then, one of them was raised by just 33 centimeters. The result? The clock that was higher up began to tick faster. But nothing was wrong with the clocks. 
it was actually time that sped up for the higher clock relative to the lower clock due to the tiniest decrease in gravity as the clock moved higher up. So you're saying that because I'm short, I'm going to have a longer lifespan than someone taller than me? I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Precise clocks measured the effects of relativity side by side being changed by that much. Absolutely amazing. Fantastic experiment. Atomic clocks were used in the 70s for that very purpose. Look at that big ass block. relativity and other scientific experiments. Y'all kids who don't know, this is, was not unusual even in the 90s. Needing two people to pick up a fucking piece of technology. We just got this thing called a cell phone. Y'all don't know. Cell phones used to be like this fucking big. And this wide. With an antenna this long. With a strap that you could use to carry it around with you. And something that looked like a fucking accordion for like numbers and shit. Right? So it's just like, that's how they first started coming out. And then like they kind of went down some. But people still prefer to, um, what is it called? Um. House phones still at the time. Uh, I almost want to get a house phone because it would be so much more simpler. I don't know, it's kind of nice having like a f my phone turned off for a bit because I really just didn't want it anymore. It was just like I ain't got a dog in that way. It can go off for like a few months. I'm cool with that. Surprisingly. Motherfucker's still just as heavy as one of the old cell phones. Mm-hmm. 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 Now, honestly, I really don't need a phone unless, like, I need to... Like, honestly, I could just go with a computer because that'd be so much more simpler with shit, honestly. Um, but this thing... So, this is an atomic clock? Just the whole fucking thing. And we just saw one that's the size of a fucking quarter, but cubed. Came a long fucking way. I'm doing some capsule corp shit right here. Mm-hmm. They um, flew some atomic clocks on airplanes. Okay, that this dude, to me, looks like... You know the dude who used to play Hercules in the television show and sometimes show up in Xena Warrior Princess? What was his name? John Sabo or Sorbo? Sorbet or some shit. He looks like he could have been his son. He even got a scroll on the wall that I think is taped up. Like, I, I'm not supposed to notice that shit. I like that lamp. Ooh, I like that painting. It's very water. I like I like his room. I like his room. On the world compared to the time before and after doing that. What they found confirmed their predictions. Time slowed down for the moving clocks. The technology ended up being integral to devices that we depend on every day. GPS. Global Tracking navigation devices. satellite systems depend on atomic clocks to help determine where you are. The time it takes for a signal traveling at the speed of light to reach your phone will give you the distance. Using four and don't you think it's weird how most people don't know how to read a map anymore? Like, I've never been, like, I can read a map. I'm not very good at it, but I know, where the, which, like, honestly, if I just go somewhere once, I know how to get there again some way or another, or figure out the way to come fucking full circle. That's how I, I, I have good, like, I guess good sense of direction, but that's only because I had a father with a good sense of direction and would tell me I'm going the wrong fucking way all the time and stop being fucking stupid. You know, because that's what men are good for. To let you know when you got an attitude and when you're being fucking stupid. Because that's necessary. Either way. Um, but it's weird. Because it's like... Do places even sell maps anymore, I wonder? Because it seems like no one even uses them. Even though I feel like they're kind of necessary. Like, you can still look it up. On your phone, yeah. But, like... Nothing means an actual physical map, you know, like, if, 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 if you know, if the power, if, 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 you know, if you run out of a charge on your phone, you can still use a map, you know what I mean? It's like books. 
versus Kindle, right? Kindle's nice for the convenience of, like, not having to carry stuff. But if it gets fucking wet, I'm gonna lose all my books until I either download it onto my computer or my laptop or even my tablet or I get a uh, new Kindle. Which would make me super uber duper sad. Because Kindles are expensive. But still, I wouldn't have to go through that if, just, if I just had the physical books. And the only downside to physical books is having them all. Because it's, it's a lot of books. Like, you got to be someone dedicated to that library. I miss my books. I had a lot of fucking books I had gathered. Some I wasn't finished reading. I definitely miss my, like, Evolution one by, uh... Gould, I think his name is G O U L D. I can't remember his first name for the life of me, but yeah, I don't know distraction. But yeah, like this would be so much more easier to you to just use a fucking map instead of a fucking phone. So much more easier, but that would require people to know how to read maps, and that's also expecting people to know how to fill out a checkbook. They don't even teach people that in school, and that should be important. They don't teach you about taxes in school. Damn shame. For more of them, you can triangulate your position. You know, I about really that. think of the atomic clocks as constantly working in the background. You, you don't see it, but... Look at all that trash! Really Look at all that trash! What the fuck is all this? Is this on the fucking satellites? Why is that all needed there? Why are all these, all these satellites needed if, like, you know... Oh yeah, like, do they realize the internet is underground with the fiber optics and shit or whatever the fuck it's called? Like, I thought it was underground. Why, like, why are there wires underground if you're just gonna litter the fucking earth with this shit? No wonder we can't see anything and the ozone layer is deteriorating. You have a clog like some fucking pores. Look at it. You have a whole fucking toupee up on this some bitch, And, like, what wants to be a fucking beard... It's fucking specks here and there. It's fucking look there. Look at that bald spot right there. Just it just cut it off. Just fucking bald. Take it all off. It doesn't even need to be there. Important for having the whole thing run. That is so the gross. The GPS meant that time dilation suddenly went from being a cool theory to something that needed to be dealt with on a daily basis. Due to the speed at which the satellites are orbiting the Earth, fourteen thousand kilometers an hour and the lower gravity in space, they are actually experiencing time differently relative to us on Earth. If you add everything up, the clocks change by about 40 microseconds, 40 millionths of a second of a day, which sounds like nothing. But if you did not take that relativity into account, every day your position on your receiver would say that you were six miles off from where you actually are. So, Okay, I have a question, right? All of these right here. So if, if we send the rocket to space, is it knocking some of this shit the fuck out? Like, is it going to hit any of this? Because this is a lot of dots. This is an excessive amount of fucking dots. Now it, it, it's gone from looking like it's got germs everywhere to fucking dandruff and shit. Which is kind of fucking... That's actually kind of bothering me a little bit. It's just getting everywhere. It's all over the black and shit. Look at all this. It's nasty. Wash your fucking hair. You have water all on you. Your, your insides is moisturized. Blah! It's just, it's just fucking me up. It's just like you're so many. Like, why is there so many? How are we able to send shit into space with all of this junk in this space? No wonder the, the fucking sun is fucking up right now. Probably doesn't even know what the fuck we is. Looking like a whole fucking, like, cell being attacked by a virus or some shit. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it kind of reminds me of. Just attaching and shit. Where you actually are. So, it would very quickly be completely useless. These dramatic effects of relativity are central to the work done here at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, mm -hmm. or NIST, in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm NIST. NIST is a leader in the development of optical atomic clocks. Oh, it's actually called NIST. These that clocks use attention. lasers to control atoms and measure their oscillations. Mm-hmm. Atomic clocks are currently the most stable and accurate way of measuring time intervals. And like any other clock, um, at the heart of an atomic clock is a very stable 
um, oscillator. So you think about um, a grandfather clock. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a pendulum yeah. that serves as the re reference oscillator. It oscillates at one cycle per second. An atomic clock is very similar. So at the heart of an atomic clock is an oscillator, which is the atom itself. Mm -hmm. so instead of having a bunch of gears and levers and springs and things, it's a series of lasers. Laser danger. Ah. Atoms trapped in an electric field receive a series of pulses which aid in controlling and measuring their oscillations. Instead of one tick per second, these clocks oscillate or tick a million billion times per second, allowing for much more precision. So it's a really small inaccuracy. It's, it's like, hard for to conceptualize that level of performance. Like drumline. These clocks are the so fast. reliable that it would take more than double the age of the universe, so around 30 billion years, to drift by even a second. That precision means relativity can also be measured with incredible accuracy. So if you move a clock up by one centimeter of height, it will tick faster by this one part in 10 to the 18. And like now we can uh, detect that kind I was of change. All fucking winter. Although, this kind of precision could be problematic, since atomic clocks keep the official time that synchronize devices all over the globe. That seems like a huge problem. I mean, how do you decide where to place the clocks if just the tiniest change in gravity causes time to slow down or speed up? That is a good point, and it's a problem that we're sort of anticipating. Now the clocks are know? getting so good that we don't know their gravitational potential well enough to define time globally at that same level. It does seem like a simpler environment somewhere out in space, farther away from these local gravitational variations. The problem of determining standard time aside, this one centimeter level precision has the potential to revolutionize the way things are measured. Using clocks to calculate height and gravity based on the amount of time dilation. This is particularly useful in geodesy, the study of the Earth's shape, orientation in space, and its gravity field. We're studying the, the motion of the crust of the Earth, uh, plate tectonics, the tides, the polar motion of Earth. There are many, Why many effects like that are observed and that can be explained. For instance, in uh, Sweden and Canada, oh, uh, it's egg. rising on the order of one to two centimeters per year. That's quite a lot. And on another part of our planet, uh, there's actually a downward land movement. So somewhere it's going up and somewhere it's going down. And such effects, of course, change everything, like the global sea level, uh, earthquakes, uh, they change even the rotation of the Earth, and much more. Huh. There's a volcano. Understanding these movements oh, can help aid bubbling. in understanding climate change, natural hazards, and construction of major structures like bridges and roads. If atomic clocks were used in this field, they could, in theory, give you height measurements that are sensitive to just one centimeter a level of accuracy GPS is not capable of. And because current methods utilize GPS and a gravimeter for determining gravity at a single point, it doesn't always give you a clear picture of what's going on. So then what the fuck is the point of them being up in the air smiling and shit if they ain't gonna get the shit right? With the clocks and everything, like what the fuck was the point of that? It's got all this, like, metal dandruff all up in the goddamn space, but, but it can't tell me the fucking time where, uh, like, I, I, it should be accurate. All right, all right, all right. It's fine. The Weather Channel has yet to lie to me anyway. Well, I'm from Germany, so let's give you an example. Uh, in Germany, we're proud to have our highest mountain. It's uh, called the Zugspitze. It's almost 3,000 meter high. But also this mountain has permafrost underneath, mm. which is now melting. And that actually gives rise uh, to a shrinking of the mountain. So the top of the mountain is probably decreasing by also uh, one or two centimeters per year. But we have not observed and measured it yet. Uh, 
because at that place, if you would put a gravimeter, uh, you would not see the signal because on a mountain you have a varying snow cover from summer and winter, the, the snow is changing, the groundwater level is mm. changing, and all these uh, local uh, changes in mass are disguising the actual effect. So if you would. So instead of having the signal point up, why don't you just put it sideways so it, it, it shoots out? Like, like that's all you would have to do with the radio thing. Like I like I don't I know I'm not smart or whatever, but like um a radio signal shoots out from the direction you put it, not just because you're putting out a signal. It, it like you could put up a radio like cuz our like our Humvees and shit, we had to use a lot of radios. And it was just like depending on how it's situated, that's the direction. Like if this is broadcasting this way, that means you can turn it sideways and it can broadcast that way. You know, you're putting out a signal. It's not just going to go everywhere. You could secure it some... Like, it doesn't even need to be at the top. It could be somewhere near, like, the end of the permafrost or whatever. And, like, you could study it. That, whatever. I don't... Like, I'm not a scientist, so whatever. Combine now your gravimeter with a clock on top of such a mountain. Then you really could resolve what the melting of the permafrost is doing to the, to the Alps because uh, the clock would not be sensitive to a very local mass change, like uh, snow cover, um, but it will really uh, measure an averaged mass and, and uh, gravitational potential and really show you the physical height of the mountain. That's why geodesy missions using atomic clocks are expected to take place in the next few years. So there's actually a mission in Germany where geodesists want to make, for the first time, a clock measurement. They want to bring, bring a, a clock to Helgoland, this is uh, the offshore island in the Northern Sea, um, to compare and get the data, because at the okay. moment this island could not be leveled. It's too far out in the ocean, and satellites uh, would not resolve it, it's too small. That's a really small uh, island. That's why there's right now a geodetic mission to bring a portable atomic clock to this island, and compared to a continental clock. Oh, nuts on an island that fucking small. Helgoland's location and size make oh, getting pretty. precise height readouts difficult. Using GPS with gravimeter data requires multiple readouts every two kilometers. So offshore areas or areas near a shore technically require you to place a gravimeter in the ocean, which is impossible. That's why the island's elevation hasn't been accurately measured to this day. Clocks can bridge the gaps to islands, deserts, or mountainous areas, which are hard to access with classical leveling methods. In turn, they can also act as height reference points for understanding ocean dynamics and global sea levels. Mm hmm Did you want to throw one in the ocean? But it's not all about okay. geodesy. We may even learn things about gravitational effects that we don't entirely understand. Mm hmm It's hard to predict what a measurement will tell you, but certainly uh, we're up to many surprises. And uh, this is actually the boundary that we physicists are trying to push now, to measure more and more precise time, frequency, space-time. As we know, it's connected in general relativity. Okay, I'm done. It's just, it, it, like, it's been bothering me, and it's like, it's like laser tag in, to my ass. Atomic clocks could be the key to answering some of the biggest mysteries in physics today that shape the universe as we Why know it. Why did it blow up like, dark what the matter. fuck? We know that there's Now dark we're just launching bombs in space, that's the nice. in the universe, and there are also, you know, models of dark matter that can be searched for and constrained using atomic clocks. So there are a lot of scientific applications. That is gorgeous. As clocks get more precise, we could find that constants used in everyday physics equations are wrong, and that could completely change how we understand the universe. Atomic clocks that we're building are the most sensitive way to look for this present-day variation in the fundamental constants. It really has the potential to revolutionize uh, physics. So do you think Atomic clocks could lead to an Einstein-esque discovery about time. I don't know why, but I did not picture him as a redhead. Or
or to kind of look like a hawk either. That like it, it's both. Honestly, it's not either or. It's both. I think it's certainly possible if we did detect that there was a drift in the fundamental constants over time. That mm-hmm. would be a revolution similar to you know the discovery of relativity or the discovery of quantum mechanics. Basically, we're doing a, a lot of tests on the predictions of Albert Einstein, because can we really assume that general relativity is the sole theory explaining everything? Or is there maybe a deviation from the predictions that general relativity makes? Ooh, look at that! That's pretty! The fact is, I don't think we do understand time very well. It's always possible that there is going to be some bright young person out there who's really terribly disturbed by the the conundrum of time and thinking it over and might come up with something brilliant but it's going to require a different way of thinking it's going to require that flash aha moment that happens once per century or even once per millennia oh that's making me trip so hard why would you do that to me why would you why would you put a whole like screensaver in there? That was nifty as fuck though, I think. That was very nifty. I hope we all learned a little bit of something from that, but I figure like no be time. Uh mind you, this one was just inspired out of nowhere. I'm not sure why that was important. But it was important somehow. But eventually we'll find out why. But I'm pretty sure there's a reason why we all need to know about atomic clocks. Hansel and Gretel shit. That's all I got. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.